Hello, I'm Todd Maddox, a nutrition support and critical care pharmacist at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. In this session, Avoiding Overfeeding and Glucose Control Management is part three of the Smart PN video series. Overfeeding can occur with both parenteral and enteral nutrition therapy. The excessive administration of any individual nutrient, micro or macronutrient, can be associated with complications. This presentation will address overfeeding associated with parenteral nutrition therapy with focus on excessive carbohydrate or glucose administration, but let's start with a brief review of the complications of overfeeding with all macronutrients. And we'll start with protein. Excessive protein or amino acids intake can result in pre-renal azotemia. For patients requiring long-term parental nutrition that provides excessive amounts of amino acids, kidney stones can occur, and there is an increased risk of developing osteoporosis. With excessive or rapid administration of intravenous lipid emulsion, hypertriglyceridemia can occur. This is usually associated with infusions exceeding 0.11 grams per kilogram per hour. Excess dextrose or glucose administration has been associated with hyperglycemia, hypertriglyceridemia, hepatic steatosis, and increased carbon dioxide production. The remainder of this presentation will focus on the complications of excessive carbohydrate administration, approaches to avoid overfeeding, appropriate nutrient intake, and strategies for glucose control. Hyperglycemia is defined as a blood or serum glucose greater than 180 mg per deciliter for hospitalized or acutely ill patients. It is the most common complication associated with parenteral nutrition and an independent factor for poor wound healing and an increased risk of infection. Elevated serum glucose concentrations impair the immune response by altering granulocyte adhesion, chemotaxis, phagocytosis, and intracellular bacterial death. Hyperglycemia has also been associated with increased mortality. Patients with hyperglycemia have an increased risk of death following a myocardial infarction or stroke. Prolonged, uncontrolled hyperglycemia may also lead to glucosuria and an osmotic diuresis resulting in the loss of water and electrolytes. This is referred to as hyperosmolar non-ketotic dehydration, which can lead to coma and death. This classic study by Wolf and colleagues demonstrated that there is a limit to the amount of energy that can be derived from glucose. In adult patients receiving parental nutrition glucose infusions exceeding 6 to 7 milligrams per kilogram per minute, there was not a significant increase in glucose oxidation as shown here in Figure 1. Furthermore, as presented in Figure 2, glucose infusion rates beyond 4 milligrams per kilogram per minute resulted in increases in carbon dioxide production represented here as VCO2. This may be problematic for patients with pulmonary disease by exacerbating respiratory insufficiency resulting in hypercapnia and respiratory acidosis and prolonged weaning from mechanical ventilation. The mechanism of liver dysfunction associated with parental nutrition is not completely known and is thought to be multifactorial. But excessive energy intake is thought to promote hepatic fat deposition by stimulating an increase in the release of insulin. In turn, this promotes lipogenesis and inhibits fatty acid oxidation. Potential causes of parental nutrition-associated liver dysfunction include overfeeding, excessive glucose or intravenous lipid dosage, lack of enteral stimulation, infection, choline or carnitine deficiency, and aluminum toxicity from contamination of parental nutrition components. More recently, phytosterols, which are naturally occurring plant sterols found in vegetable oil-based IV lipid emulsion, have been implicated as potential contributor to development of parental nutrition-associated liver disease. The goal of nutrition support therapy is to minimize the energy deficit and avoid overfeeding. The first strategy to avoid overfeeding is to obtain the most accurate determination of resting metabolic rate or energy expenditure. The gold standard for this is indirect calorimetry. But not all institutions have indirect calorimetry technology, and even those that do may be selective with its use in certain patient populations, as well as the frequency of measurements. If the latter, indirect calorimetry is most useful for underweight critically ill or acutely ill patients, 
because use of predictive equations for these patients is more likely to inaccurately estimate metabolic rates than that for those with normal weight or obese patients. Indirect calorimetry is also useful for patients with pre-admission fluid overload, such as ascites, and there is no reported reliable weight with normal hydration. There is no absolute indication for indirect calorimetry. All indications are relative. In most instances, when a perennial nutrition formulation is being developed, a measured resting metabolic rate is not available, so the clinician must rely on a method to estimate energy expenditures. Predictive equations have been used for over 100 years. Equations have been derived for various populations, including healthy individuals, acutely ill, and critically ill patients. Efforts have also been made to calculate energy expenditure from the mechanical ventilator VCO2 measurement. A thorough discussion on the use of indirect calorimetry, predictive equations, and other methods used to determine or estimate energy expenditure is beyond the scope of this session. Another strategy for avoiding overfeeding is the appropriate amount of nutrients. The rate of dextrose infusion should not exceed 4 to 5 milligrams per kilogram per minute or 20 to 25 calories per kilogram per day. As discussed previously, glucose oxidation plateaus at this point and the risk of hyperglycemia increases. Clinical studies have reported that for non-diabetic patients receiving parental nutrition, 50% will develop hyperglycemia when the dextrose infusion exceeds 4 mg per kilogram per minute. When determining the amount of dextrose a patient receives, clinicians should consider other sources of dextrose such as IV fluids and IV medications in dextrose. For IV lipid emulsions, the maximum rate of infusion is 0.11 grams per kilogram per hour, which is the same for both soybean oil-based emulsions and the four oil or SMOF emulsion. Lipids should provide 15 to 30 percent of energy. Medications such as propofol, which is in a 10 percent soybean oil emulsion vehicle, can contribute a significant amount of energy. The contribution of this lipid-derived energy should be accounted for when developing the parental nutrition formulation and monitoring a patient's daily energy intake. The appropriate or desired amount of protein for a patient is based on many factors, including baseline nutrition status, disease, clinical state, and organ function. The values here are general rules. There is extensive literature on this topic, especially the protein needs of critically ill patients. A complete discussion about the optimal protein dose for patients is beyond the scope and time limitations of this presentation. Perennial nutrition is usually continued until the patient consistently consumes at least 50 to 75 percent of energy and protein needs from enteral nutrition or oral diet. If the patient has signs of continued improvement, parental nutrition can be discontinued over a short period without adjusting the parental nutrition formulation. However, those with a complicated course may need a longer weaning period. Dervan and colleagues used a parental nutrition weaning protocol in which parental nutrition was decreased by 30 milliliters an hour once enteral nutrition achieved the same rate and was discontinued when enteral nutrition reached goal infusion rate. They demonstrated less overfeeding with the protocol than prior to the protocol. For many patients transitioning to enteral tube feeding or an oral diet, simply decreasing or discontinuing the IV lipid emulsion portion of the PN regimen is a simple and practical intervention that results in less risk of overfeeding fat and total calories for many patients. Aspen recommends a target blood glucose concentration of 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter for hospitalized acutely ill adult patients receiving parental nutrition. The Aspen and Society of Critical Care Medicine clinical guidelines suggest a target range of 150 to 180 milligrams per deciliter for general ICU patients. Ranges for other specific patient populations such as head trauma may exist but will not be addressed in this discussion. Insulin corrective regimens may be administered via the subcutaneous route in IV infusion or added to the parental nutrition admixture. Subcutaneous administration of short or rapid acting insulin may be used as the first approach to glucose control for patients with blood glucoses exceeding 180 mg per deciliter and receiving parental nutrition.
An IV insulin infusion provides consistent and safe glucose control as it can be adjusted based on frequent blood glucose concentrations. This method is frequently used for critically ill patients. However, this method may not be feasible outside of the ICU because it requires intense nursing time for the blood glucose monitoring and adjusting the insulin infusion. An initial insulin regimen of 0.05 to 0.1 units per gram of dextrose in the perennial nutrition solution is common, or 0.15 to 0.2 units per gram of dextrose may be used in patients who are already hyperglycemic. In addition to this initial insulin added to the perennial nutrition formulation, a correctional insulin regimen using a short or rapid acting insulin should be used as an effort to achieve blood glucose concentrations within the target range. Two-thirds of the total amount of the correctional insulin required over 24 hours may be then added to the next day's parental nutrition formulation. As the dextrose content is increased or decreased, the amount of insulin should also be proportionally adjusted. The administration of insulin to patients receiving parental nutrition does have some risk of hypoglycemia and measures should be in place to manage this adverse event. This slide presents a guidance for determining the dextrose content of the initial parental nutrition formulation for adult patients without a history of diabetes mellitus and those patients with a history of diabetes mellitus or baseline hyperglycemia. For those patients without an elevated blood glucose, the initial dextrose dose is 150 to 200 grams per day. This should be decreased to 100 to 150 grams per day for those patients with diabetes or baseline hyperglycemia. Capillary glucose should be assessed every 6 to 8 hours and more frequently in those who are critically ill. If blood glucose is consistently within the target range, the dextrose can be advanced towards goals. If blood glucoses are greater than 180 mg per deciliter, insulin therapy should be initiated. For those patients for whom dextrose is advanced toward goals and do not require insulin therapy, capillary glucose monitoring should be continued until stable and then discontinued. A daily assessment of serum glucose can be decreased to once daily. So in summary, excessive energy or overfeeding can result in hyperglycemia, increased carbon dioxide production, and steatosis. Hyperglycemia is the most common complication of perennial nutrition therapy and is associated with increased morbidity and mortality. Strategies to avoid overfeeding include appropriate dosing of macronutrients in the perennial nutrition formulation, and insulin therapy may be used in the management of hyperglycemia in adult patients receiving parental nutrition therapy. And finally, a more detailed discussion of the information presented here today is available in these references. This educational offering was provided to you by Aspen and supported by an educational grant provided by Baxter Healthcare.